we gather in the name of the creator, redeemer, and author of life. In a time of uncertainty, we confess our sins. We'll take a moment now in silence for our own confession. God of grace, we come to you speaking for ourselves and as a community, naming what is demanding in this world and heavy on our hearts. God's mercy is immeasurable. There is more than enough. In life, in death, and throughout our journey, God is with us. Hear today what God has already given you. Forgiveness, love, and a place in God's story, all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Pray together, God of the journey. In the midst of unknown places and unfamiliar times, 
you reassure us that your promise of presence and love is secure. May we all hear today that you are creating a future with hope. But in the meantime, you never leave us as we search and yearn. In Jesus' name, amen. Joni. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 10. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother, father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age? Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, in fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of our Lord. Kevin and I were kind of wondering if we were going to stand the whole service, which wasn't fun. Uh, before I begin, let me say, I heard, I think Beth was saying nice things about me, but I was so busy talking to the choir out there before the service, I didn't hear them. But let me say thank you. And uh, before I uh, begin my sermon, let me just say what an honor it is for me um, to be here today. Uh, Forty years ago, I believe it was, my uh, wife... Uh, came uh, to Mount Olivet, a Mount Olivet that looked very different than this um, and still had IVs across the road for you old timers. I, I miss IVs. Um, she came here as a pastoral intern with uh, Pastor Keith Freeze. And uh, 40 years ago, uh, this congregation was, was very kind to her and, uh, and to me. And uh, if you knew Pastor uh, uh, Keith Freeze, you knew... Uh, well, he was kind of a goofball, but he was, he was, he was the most lovable goofball and wonderful pastor um, ever, and a great, uh, a great pastor for my wife to intern with, and he became a good friend of mine. And so this is, uh, this is an honor for me to come back here. And um, as you know, this uh, congregation has had a history of, uh, of good pastors, and uh, none more so than uh, today. Uh, with my friend Beth. Uh, I'm just going to tell you something here. Uh, 
Uh, it's been a hard 20 months for uh, pastors. Uh, and I know it's been, it's been a hard 20 months for everybody. Um, but it's been a really difficult time for pastors. And I, I, I uh, Zoom with pastors all over the country. And uh, there's a, a, um, I've just seen it on their faces how hard it's going to be. So I got a word for you. Um, be nice to your pastor. Uh, care for her um, because I know how much she cares about all of you. Amen. Thanks for coming. All right. <laughs> Grace unto you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, as our uh, text begins today, um, uh, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus. Um, in a couple of verses, we're going to find out that this guy's wealthy. He has everything he could want. Uh, he and his wife have his and her Teslas. Uh, their, their, uh, uh, their house is, is so amazing. Um, it, it, it's a smart house with an IQ. Um, okay, that joke didn't work. We won't do that at the next service. <laughs> Let me just say this. The guy's rich, right? And, and on top of that, we're told he's, uh, he's a good man. He, he, he keeps the commandments. He, he packs food at Feed My Starving Children, donates blood, goes to church, gives Pastor Peter three foot putts. <laughs> this guy's okay. It, it seems like he shouldn't have a worry in the world, um, which is actually what makes uh, these verses we've just heard today so odd. Because all of the other people in Mark's gospel who come and kneel before Jesus either have some dread disease or they're demon-possessed. Is there something wrong with this rich man? Is he sick? Um, actually, it turns out that he, what he wants is an answer to a question. So, so kneeling before Jesus, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, the rich man addresses Jesus with, with great reverence, not just teacher, but, but, but good teacher. He's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you'd meet with me. But he has this question, what should I do? And in verse 21, um, we have what may be the sweetest verse in the Bible. We read this. Jesus looking at him, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. It's important to note that what Jesus is about to say to this guy is going to be some hard words. But they're said in love. And this is what Jesus said. You lack one thing. Okay, the rich guy who thought he had everything lacks one thing. Go sell what you own, give the money to the poor, then come, follow me. Jesus gives them a command here, actually, actually four commands. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, then come, follow me. Go, sell, give, follow. Four little verbs that would haunt the man forever. Jesus clearly knows some things that we don't know. He's, he's seen the, the man's tax returns, and he's seen his heart. And, 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 and Jesus tells him that he must sell all that he has and give his money to the poor. Now, now from the point of view of the Mount Olivet Stewardship Committee, um, it appears that Jesus has kind of blown it here, right? Um, if Jesus had just asked for a contribution, even a large contribution, I, I, I think if it was reasonable, he, he would have gotten it, right? And it, it would have helped their bottom line. Remember, um, they had to take a lunch off of a little kid just to feed the 5,000. They, they could have used the cash, right? But Jesus isn't concerned with raising funds. Jesus' concern is saving souls. And, and, and the rich man was asked to give everything that he had, not, not for Jesus' sake, but for his own. 
Now, the rich man had come for a little spiritual advice, he thought, and he's con confronted with this reality, that God is not really his God at all. He, he, he really worships money and power and success and himself. And we read, when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The, the rich man turns around. He, he, he walks away from Jesus. He will not go. He will not sell. He will not give. He will not follow. He walks away. And this is the only time in the New Testament that someone knelt before Jesus and they were not healed. And the reason was money. Now, I want to be clear here. Some of you are getting nervous. <laughs> Jesus never claims that money is bad in and of itself. If we look at a story like, like uh, the Good Samaritan, right, we can see that money can be used for good. If, if the Samaritan hadn't had the money to share, he, he wouldn't have been able to take the man to an inn and pay for the room, make sure he was taken care of. It, it took money to do that. And Jesus comes across rich people throughout the New Testament, people like, like Zacchaeus and, and Nicodemus. He doesn't ask them to give all their money away. Money, money if used correctly, can, can enhance our relationship with God and with others. Money isn't always bad. The question is only how you use it, or perhaps more importantly, how it uses you. The, 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 the problem isn't that the rich man had a lot of money. It's that he had the wrong attitude about his money. It is the most important thing in his life more important than God, more important than eternal life, more, more important than his neighbors. He, he, he cannot follow Jesus because he's following something else. And let's be honest. We, we can fall into that money trap too. And, 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 and I'll admit, it happens to me. If you think that somebody who goes into this line of work um, doesn't know about the temptations of money, um, you would be very wrong. Um, I know that pull, too. Um, you, you may think that I just sit in my office all week and pray and read the Bible, um, but I do other less important things, um, like managing my fantasy football teams. Um, and I do this. I casually, but intently, Go to the website where I can get immediate updates on the status of my retirement accounts. Stock market down? Oh, let me check. Or, 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 or I turn to my computer and I go to that website that's named after a river. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. And, and, and I see if there isn't something there that I just have to have today. And, and I know these things aren't the, aren't the worst things in the world. But it's easy, it's so easy to slip into a selfishness that claims that all that I have is my own. And, and then it becomes money, not God, that makes me secure. It's money that brings me happiness. Um, there's a fantastic TED Talk. I don't know if you watch these things ever, but, um, but there's a great one. It's called Money can buy happiness. It's by um, Michael Norton, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And, and let me give you a brief summary of it. Um, people who win the lottery think that their lives are going to be amazing. You've probably heard about this one. They almost never are. They, they, they often buy too much, and even though they've had this huge windfall, they often go into debt. And they're constantly bugged by family and friends who are looking for handouts, which annoys them. And often their social relationships are ruined. The, the, the more they have, the more selfish and the less happy they become. 
No, we all say, yeah, well, let me try, right? Nobody believes it. But that's what the Harvard guy says. And, and Norton had this hypothesis that maybe the reason money doesn't make them happy is that they were spending their money on the wrong things. So this is what academics do. They, they, they set up an experiment, right? And, and, and that's what he did. He did it with college students. There were two groups, two groups. And, and half of them were, were given money and they were told that they had to go and spend it on themselves. And, and the other half were, were given the same amount of money and they were told they had to go out and spend the money on others. Now, they often made the same purchases because if you give a college student money, it looks like a cup of coffee. But, but some of them drank it themselves and, and some of them gave it to somebody else to have a cup of coffee. So they all came back a few hours later and, 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 and it turned out that the, the, the students who had been given money to spend on themselves, they were unchanged. They were blasé about the whole experience, ho-hum. But the group who spent money on others could not have been more happy. They, 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 they were excited. They, um, they, they, they had stories to tell, right? They're sharing all these stories. One, one guy had, um, um, uh, one of the students had found a homeless guy in the street and he, he had took him into McDonald's and bought him half the menu. And, and he said, you wouldn't have believed the look on this guy's face. It was great. And they all, they all had stories like that. They, they, they had fun giving money away. Okay, that was uh, with college students in Vancouver. But, but then they went around the world and they ran the same test and it, it worked exactly the same in Uganda. And, and actually the Gallup organization has um, done polling and in almost every country in the world, um, when, when people give money to, to, to a charity or some other good cause, it makes them happier than when they spend it on themselves. So, this is the Harvard conclusion. Spending money on other people has a bigger return on investment for your happiness than spending it on yourself. That's the Harvard guy. And that's what Jesus says, too. We are never more like God than when we give something away. That's when, that's when we're happy. That's actually, that's, that's when we're whole. And in giving away, that's when we become closest to others and to God. Now the problem, of course, is that e it's easier said than done. It, it, it's hard to believe that winning the lottery wouldn't be the best thing that ever, that ever happened to you. It, 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 it's hard to believe that giving money to a food shelf would make you happier than buying a new BMW. It, it's hard to believe that, that, that buying Twins tickets or Viking tickets or, or Timberwolves tickets wouldn't be more fun than dropping money in the offering plate. Okay, that one we get. These Minnesota teams are terrible. Who uh, <laughs> might, as well give it, might as well give it to the church. But giving money away is actually hard for us. And, 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 and I don't think that temptation in the years ahead is going to get any easier, right? Three of the largest and most influential companies in the world are going to grow only by increasing your desire to buy stuff, right? Facebook and, and, and Google claim to be out about other things, but here's what they are. They're advertising companies. They're, 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 they're getting all of your information so that they can send you an ad that will get you to buy something that will give them money. That's their goal. You buy stuff. And then where do you buy it? You go to that third company, Amazon. You, you push two buttons and it shows up right at your door. You don't even have to go to the store anymore to accumulate all of this stuff. 
And I'll just tell you, it doesn't bring happiness. In, in, in fact, like the, the rich man, you can have everything, but it's still not enough. I, I, I love in our confession, um, if, you take, if we take for ourselves rather than sharing what we have been given, right? Eventually, eventually you'll feel the emptiness of that. And, and, and then I think that you will feel the need to come and kneel before Jesus. And, 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 and you're going to ask Jesus, what should I do? And you know what? Jesus will look at you. Jesus will look at you and love you. And, and he will say, my friend, just put your trust in me, not in yourself, not in, not in your money. Put your trust in me and I will show you the way. It's a way of caring for others more than you care for yourself. It's a way of generosity, a, a, a way of compassion. And, and you will find, as you listen to Jesus, as you feel his love, you will find that when you use your money for the sake of others, Jesus' way is a way of happiness and joy and peace. Amen. Um, we will now uh, share the peace and um, extend the offering. And each and every week we tell a small story here at Mount Olivet. And um, one that continues to <clears throat> evolve here is um, kids and kids. And uh, the ninth graders who were confirmed last year are 10th graders this year. And um, we've just had a need as Bible explorers or a Sunday school or also on Wednesdays. We have just needed more and more teachers, and um, it's actually the high school kids who are showing up in abundance <laughs> to teach the little ones. And um, I can tell you firsthand, sometimes they come home and they go, Mom, that was nuts. And um, to remind them that they were back there not too long ago. Um, and I don't know if you always get to see that because the kids are with kids but it's kind of this emerging sense of even at um, a teenage year that you have something to give and those little ones just look up to them like looking into an oscillating fan thinking they're the coolest. And um, somehow this ongoing sense of what faith means at any age is in abundance here at Mount Olivet. And you just have to name that, um, that everyone matters and everyone makes a difference in it goes back to that promise we make um, to know and celebrate his call in the world. And you just don't get to be an adult and do that. You do that at any age. So we just celebrate 
And it's because of our community that that happens, so we're deeply grateful for that. So um, I invite you, if you're here at church, to share a socially distanced sign of peace. If you're online, you just comment away. And I'm really grateful to have the choir here to sing for us kids. I have your offering basket up front. You can put your coins and dollars in there. Everything goes uh, for hunger in the world. And if you brought your offering today, we have a little box um, out at the welcome counter to place that in. Thank you so much for that. And now may the peace of God be with you all. Let's both share and receive peace from each other.
you cry out. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection has opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels and with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymns. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now in all the places that we are at, we join together and pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There's a place for you at God's table. Um, how can this be? It seems impossible that we could ever enter into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' words, it is impossible for us, it's possible for God, and the means God takes is to take a little bit of something and with it bring in all that God is about with both a promise and a call. And the story we hear is a call story. But God never gives up. We only get to hear this much of this rich man, but God never stops pursuing in this world. And that gift of grace is for you in the struggle and the doubt where you are today to be set free for your hope, for your unanswered question. And so if God can come in a little piece of bread and a little sip of wine, then that means that God can come in your life and our future here at Mount Olivet. And that is what we trust in each and every week. And that's why we come to this meal and hear this story again and again. So now may the body of Christ be given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. So after we have been fed, have um, been caught up in the story of God and forgiven, um, we now pray and um, to trust that as Jesus looks at that man and loves him, that God looks at us and loves us in the struggle. And not only that, but we have each other along the way, and it's been harder to do as we have been distanced from each other. And so since the very beginning, we have just prayed together and know that your prayer that is spoken today, if you choose to do so, um, gets sent out into the world via your community for people to come alongside you. Um, and you just never know what someone has, uh, whether it be a shared experience or um, something to nourish you on the way or to say, you know, I've been in something similar and um, you don't do this alone. And so um, if you're online, I'll give you a minute to type your comments in and I'll read those together. I have a few that you've written down and then for you who are gathered here as well. Um, if you choose to, just raise your hand and I will come and we will pray together. So let's pray. Um, good and gracious God, <clears throat> uh, for a story again that just comes and uh, squeezes us on our heart, um, somehow uh, we can understand in the community that we are in uh, what it means to have money and uh, God, that you have interest in that and that you have a call there. And uh, for all the ways that when we look up and see out into the world in a need and that quite possibly that you call us with anything and everything that we have to make a difference, um, it sets us free to be able to fly in a way that we're not able to do on our own. But gosh, God, we need to hear it all the time. And you need to remind us, and we need to be invited into that. So for all the ways that those verbs Pastor Peter talked about today um, plant themselves in our own heart, um, most especially to follow you, that we can't lead it on our own, that we trust that you're ahead of us always. And for all these things, God, in your mercy our prayer. All right. Um, first of all, some things that you have written down today. Uh, thankful for our Aunt Meredith who has come to visit this weekend. Oh, I love that prayer. Um, for uh, the coming um, of an aunt and then that you're worshiping together. That's really meaningful. A uh, reminder of the impact um, that we have on each other's lives and what it means to be able to celebrate that life together. Uh, we're so grateful. So welcome, Meredith. God, in your mercy, for our prayer. Uh, prayers for um, Breivik, Mission, Bre Breivik Mission, Alaska, and for the COVID outbreak. Deb, uh, your sister lives there, um, and your niece has COVID. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, prayers um, in this place in Alaska and a lot of places in this world and even close here, um, this ongoing sense of what we need in this time and for the healing for people, uh, it's a community that needs to work together in these next steps um, and for us to remember those people struggling in the midst, uh, frustrated and um, overworked and uh, overworried in all of these things. God, in your mercy. Yeah, Laura, uh, joining you, we've been praying for Laura's dad um, who had an abscess on his spine that was removed in the midst of um, his Parkinson's and for his continued mobility in many different ways, just celebrating the dailiness of what that healing looks like, Laura, and for your mom who's there um, in the midst to see that too. Uh, we just celebrate that recovery. God, in your mercy. Oh, Bishop Ann is on, Pastor Peter. It's so good to hear Pastor Peter Geisinger for Lindgren preach and to share his gifts with Mount Olivet. Um, blessings to Pastor Beth and all of Mount Olivet in this time of transition. Thank you, Bishop Ann. So great to have you online. See what happens when you come. The bishop, the bishop comes to you, Peter. <laughs> it happens. I, I wish I would have tried harder. <laughs> Oh, 
um, thank you for a meaningful, a meaningful prayer, Bishop Ann. It's good to have you here. Um, God in your mercy. I kind of froze up on the screen, so I'm going to just press this little button and see if more pops up. But in the meantime, what prayers do you have? And then I'll pop back to online. If you have another one online, um, I'll come right back to you. Prayers that you, you all have today. Yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, we pray for Sarah um, and her family. God, a friend of Lindsay's, um, her dad died of MS, um, and for grief in the midst, and um, for years that are yet to be lived with the grandkids and not being able to be there um, for what that family needs each and every day, and just for compassion for all people are caring that we may know or may not know. Um, it's not a snap of the fingers. Um, it's figuring out a new normal and a way of life ahead. So uh, God for Sarah um, and her family, for her dad's life in this world and also in death, that you have a future for all of us. Uh, God, in your mercy. Are you Meredy? Yeah. Hi, Aunt Meredy. Indeed. Um, for Bill with upcoming health challenges, and thank you, Meredy, for reminding us. Um, there's just a ripple effect um, of, of care communities and families and the toll that takes and um, how life adjusts. So um, in the midst and on the way for healing to come in many different ways. God, in your mercy. Yeah, Renee. And thank you, for, na uh, for naming truth in the midst. Um, we always have a little, um, maybe a shorter version of how are you doing. Um, but for you to speak, uh, the heaviness that you're feeling right now and the weariness because there's many people depending on you. From your mom at 95 to your son and for your husband here too. Um, and so our prayer is for you to be able to exhale and let that, let that wait and also know that you do not do this alone, a wide community. And uh, the prayer is for those connections, uh, resources to come your way. And because so many people are dependent on you, for you to know that you're loved and cared for and for you to give yourself that care that you need in the midst as well. For healing God um, in very large and very small ways each day. God, in your mercy. Yeah, John. <clears throat> That's so great. Um, so John is in a music group, and you haven't been able to perform publicly, and you're back at that a little bit. Um, for that call that you have and uh, your group along with you, and for the joy that that brings back into the world to see those glimpses of that again, God, in your mercy. Um, God, for all these things that we pray today, um, online prayers, in-person prayers, prayers in our hearts, um, and to be able to be community for each other, uh, we're so deeply grateful. Amen. So um, a couple announcements for you today. Um, you've heard more than once from me that our posture this fall is a posture of listening. 
and that is because we all hold um, pretty profound and sacred stories from the last 20 months, and we haven't been able to tell each other those stories like we've been able to do. And we truly believe that God is in the midst of those stories, um, not only connecting us to each other, but also paving the future for Mount Olivet. What did we experience, or how did we have to pivot, or what are we missing, and how could God be in the midst of that for what is next for Mount Olivet? And so um, we really value and honor your stories, and we are uh, doing many things this fall, but I invite you to come to Mo Talk in the, in the fireside room. Uh, we're simply asking you to bring a story that you experienced to be able to share um, within the group and a cup of coffee along with that. If you brought a little artifact, bring the artifact with you as well, and we'll just have time to be able to listen. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you in there in a couple minutes. And then um, we are um, in the midst of calling a, a new pastor here at Mount Olivet, and uh, the call committee is um, at work. We expect to get candidates um, within the next week or so to begin um, that process of reviewing those and uh, begin interviews, and we're pretty excited about that. But the call committee is here. I know Diane is here, and Nick is here, and Lindsay's here, um, and they will be out in the Welcome Center uh, for you to interact, and you don't have to have a question. Um, just come and tell them something that you're excited about or something that's important to you, because we really value that in our work that we have ahead and your ongoing prayers um, for what could be and who this next person will be um, is really exciting, so we're grateful for that. And now I invite you to stand as we sing. Be blessed by God who finds you in the wilderness, by Jesus who listens and forgives, by the Spirit creating a way. Go in peace, the story unfolds. Come, 
and see.